Hi everyone, today we are talking with Darren Hughes in our weekly interviews, in our, in our series of weekly interviews. Darren is uh, director of Kishov Europe. He actually is responsible for their business in the UK, but he will uh, tell us more about it by himself. Hi. Hi there. Thank you for the uh, for welcoming me onto your uh, to your show. Thank you. So, how are you? How how are your businesses going these days during the COVID? Yeah, yeah, that, that's a that's a good question. So let, let's maybe we'll just jump in and talk about what COVID has done to businesses in Europe. So so we're a, uh, a an international fintech company. We have offices in London, uh, which I look after, London and European. We have two offices in in Russia. Uh, one in Yaroslavl, one in Moscow, where we do a lot of our development and innovation. And then we have another office in Hong Kong. And so COVID, of course, is, is one of those rare events that, that we just don't normally see that affects pretty much everybody at the same time over a very short period of time. And, and just from the discussions with my colleagues in other offices, just with some of our clients that we speak to worldwide. So what is happening with COVID in Brazil? What is happening with COVID in Ghana in Africa? What is happening in Azerbaijan or, or the Philippines? You know, and understanding, you know, each market is slightly different. Each country is slightly different. You probably know in the UK, we have quite a high number of cases and quite a high number of deaths. Uh, I think that's partly due to that, you know, we're a very international uh, hub spot. You know, if you look at, we had, the UK had something like 20 million different people come through its airports in the first 90 days of 2020. 20 million people is, is almost like a, like a third of our country has actually transitioned through our country uh, on other ways. So it doesn't surprise me, you know, that we're hit pretty bad. Uh, we have a lot of people transferring, a lot of people carrying the virus. Um, so London has been shut down pretty heavily. Um, but then how does that affect us in terms of businesses? And, you know, and I think when, you know, we work with banks, we work with financial institutions, payday lenders, uh, insurance companies, telecoms, etc. And when you look at those uh, from region to region, they've all reacted in similar but different ways. Now, most companies do some level of remote working, uh, but not on this sort of scale. And I think that's what's caught many companies off guard is, is that scale of being able to uh, have everybody pretty much remote working, but keeping it business as normal. Um, and so some, some of our clients and, and our potential clients have done really well at that. They're like, okay, yeah, we will set up for this anyway. It's just an expansion of what we already do. Other companies really found it difficult. And, and I think when you see that difficulty, then you understand that actually um, the challenges and, and how much emphasis companies put on things like disaster recovery or business continuity reports that you know, any, any company should have, what do you do if something goes wrong and are you prepared for it? Most of that stuff comes into what does my technology look like? What does my access look like? And can people do their jobs? And I think it showed that a lot of companies were underprepared, uh, which doesn't surprise me. Um, but, you know, and I think how does that then affect us as a business? Um, so, of course, as we're talking with banks or financial institutions about implementing new type of technology that we deliver for them, they're like, yeah, we just need to try and get all of our other stuff ready before we look at some of that. So, so us as a business, of course, is then affected because of the delays within, the, within our clients. So the way that we pivoted and said, right, okay, if we know that some of our clients, they like our solutions, they want to sign contracts, but we're not quite at that stage to do that yet, what do we need to do? So we spent a lot of this time looking and saying, okay, let's look at new regions, let's look at countries or new uh, niche markets that we want to go after with our same products. What does the market look like? What are our competitors look like? What are our competitors doing? How are they approaching the market? What are the companies that we want to approach in those markets? And then how much research can we really do so that we feel confident when we go to that market that we understand essentially who they are, what they're doing, what their challenges might be. So understanding if we can see that they've developed something, could they develop it much further? What additional items could they add to make that current service even better than, than what it is already? So if we take something like uh, personal financial management reports, for, for example, so within banks, uh, quite often, certainly in the European marketplace, they will offer uh, reporting within their mobile applications and web applications. Uh, so they will allow the customer to maybe set some uh, budgets for expenditure on 
different items, maybe travel or entertainment or groceries. But they might also then allow the customer to set some goals, saving goals, something like that. But, but that's pretty basic level. What we would then look and say is that, OK, if we understand that the banks are doing those type of services, what, how do they then take that to the next level? How do they then get more engagement? How do they then increase their monthly average users on their web application? What additional items could they in include so that they uh, start to see a benefit? How do we start talking to them about something that they're gonna, going to understand? And so an addition for them could be is like, well, how do they start producing content that is going to be more relevant for their users within their mobile applications that's going to keep their, their user um, on their mobile application or their web application longer? So it's trying to increase the average time spent on their applications. So we know within banking, for example, customers are much more loyal to banks the more features that a bank offers. So if they offer budgeting, that will increase the, 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 the usability of a customer, then will increase their lifetime. If we include goals, if we include some, some content, um, if we include some more deeper analytics, you know, if the more type of features that, that the bank can build in, the longer the customer will stay. Will stay. So, what, so what we've done actually during this period is, sure, we work with our current clients to make sure everything is working as it should do. Uh, the, the current prospects that we were talking to were varying. Some of them were able to proceed. Others were saying, hold on, we need to try and get our stuff together before we can look at this. So any kind of downtime that we had is that we really looked at those new markets, those new, new niches and said, what do we need to identify when we want to start reaching out to these client, potential clients? How do we talk to them in a language that they're instantly going to understand, you know, so that we, we understand their business rather than just saying, would you like to buy this? We're saying, we understand that you're doing this. Can I just show you a way that you could maybe increase your monthly average users by 42% by doing one little thing? And, and it's just trying to then show them how that works. Normally, it's a pretty... Uh, just, a, just an interesting way for them to say, actually, we can do something else. We, we can make our services better. So yeah, COVID has been, has been difficult for a number of reasons. And I think for businesses, certainly fintech businesses, um, you, you have to think about what do you do next? How do you, how do you kind of make that pivot to ensure that you are, you're being productive and, and you're doing work that's going to pay you off at some point? Now that, that, that research that we've done, you know, we, we've got research for different countries, uh, different niches within different countries. And I think that enables us to be able to start thinking, right, well, where do we want to move next? If we want to target on the, on, uh, if we want to try and grow our business within either the European or outside of the European market, which country do we go to next? Where is the demand? What type of companies are there? How advanced are they? Where do we see that possibility? That it's, all, it's all stuff that you have to do when you want to approach a new region or a new country anyway. Um, I think it, this particular period gave us an opportunity to be able to do a lot of that and really start thinking about what we're going to be doing over the next two or three years and prioritizing those regions and those countries. That's actually a very optimistic point of view when you're um, trying to find some solutions, some problems to, to solve and etc. Uh, one question about um, I've seen your interview from November of uh, past year and uh, it was about that cash, cash off now the, the, that days uh, was focused on um, cashback mostly uh, up to 50 percent you, you said uh, what is the current focus what what have you found in your researches in different countries is if it's not a secret no 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 it's, it's not a secret at all so so I, I should maybe explain we do three core products really business to business products one one of them is cashback you were right um the thing that makes us completely unique is that we are uh, brand funded cashback rather than store funded so that means if you look at most cashback services available on the market it means if you shop at uh, a particular store puma nike adidas for example you will receive maybe 5% back. That's, that's nice, but it, it actually ties, it means that the customer has to go to that store or purchase online via that store, um, and it doesn't really give them a lot of freedom. So we work in a slightly different way where we work on uh, brand funded cashback, and we normally work down to uh, like a grocery item level as well, or household item levels. 
So whilst you're doing your grocery shopping, you can receive cash back of up to 50% on everyday items that you buy. Shampoo, diapers for the child, dog food, whatever it might be that you're purchasing, you can receive up to 50% back. And, and that isn't done by the store. So it doesn't matter if you shop at supermarket A or supermarket B, as long as you buy that brand and you can prove your purchase, then you can receive the cash back. And, and the reason that we do that is it gives greater flexibility to the consumer and it increases the engagement. Uh, and it also increases the potential payout for the customer. So, so if we look at things like grocery items and household items, you have to buy them. You know, you have to buy beer every week. You have to buy chocolate. You have to buy all the things that we like, you know. Um, and so they're, they're not one off purchases. Whereas if you buy something from Puma or Nike, that might be once in an occasion. Whereas so what we're doing is working on things where the transaction volume is really high and that gives us an opportunity to be able to learn more about each particular customer so we can start learning what products you're buying where you are in your life cycle if you're buying children's items we know if you're buying pet items we know you know uh if you're buying certain vitamins we might know which sort of age you are so it gives us more uh transactional data item data to actually build up a better picture of the customer um, so yeah, so we offer that, that cash back via mobile applications within banks or financial institutions, mobile application as a white label service. Um, and that's just one of the, the solutions that we offer. The second one that we offer is data analytics. So I spoke a little bit about personal financial management reporting, which is basically allowing banking customers to, to run their own reports within their mobile applications or web applications. Um, so that, that, that gives that customer greater financial control over their position. You know, they can set in their budgets, they see their income, their expenditures, they can categorize all of their transactions. Um, and then the, the third service we offer is like a, is a data aggregation. So that, that allows the customer to bring all of their other uh, accounts from other, from other third parties into the one mobile application. So if we have bank A, they can, that customer can bring their accounts with bank B, bank C, bank D, into bank A's mobile application. So in, in Europe, we have something called open banking, uh, but outside of Europe, the, the same principle occurs. Uh, it's just done in a slightly different way, but it means that the customer can bring all of their data into one place, which means they can manage their money in a better way. So they can bring bank accounts, loyalty programs, e-wallets, uh, telecoms, loan providers, anything they want really into, their, into the mobile application to have all of that data together. That's great for the customer. So along with the analytics, they can manage their money in a much better way, which means they use the mobile applications and the web applications even more. They become more engaged. They become more loyal to that bank because the bank is providing all of the services for them. Um, but it's also great for the bank. So the more data that the customer brings in, the better that they know you and I. So if you bring in your loyalty store cards, if you bring in your uh, other accounts, savings or loans, and that's all visible. It means it's visible to the bank to make better decisions. They have your true financial position. They know exactly what you're spending, how much income you have, how much savings, what loans and commitments you have. Uh, but then also, again, it's, we can start bringing that transactional items in and right down to item level, to so SKU level, we can start showing uh, and understanding who that customer is on, on, real, on a real level, their complete financial position. So the bank can make better informed and faster lending decisions. They truly know the financial position of their customer and then they can start tailoring the products to that customer as well. So if we know that you have a savings account or a loan, loan account somewhere else, uh, you know, that, that bank can then make a slightly different offer to you as an individual. It's about trying to treat every single customer almost as an individual rather than mass promotions of a new savings account or loan product you can start segmenting the database to very precise criteria even down to an individual level to to make the user to make the the user experience more personal and and i think that's really where we're going in the future is is how do we make these experiences and those connections with your financial providers um relevant because quite often they're not relevant. You know, it, even in the UK at the moment, I open my mobile app every time for my bank and it offers me a personal loan every time. It's done it for two years. <laughs> you know, and I'm like, I've not taken a loan with you in two years. You might want to offer me something different. 
And so it's, it, it's just trying to really understand and each individual and the cash back is a big part of that. That cash back data um, and the transactional data from store cards, loyalty cards, um, enables us to build up a true picture of the individual uh, and, and provide a lot of that personalization. And if you, you know, if you get that personalization, the customer will stay, stay with you. So in Europe, 74% um, of customers will give more data to companies they trust if they will give them a discount on something they're interested in purchasing. So that's three quarters of your customer base will say, yep, use my data however you want, as long as you make it relevant to me. And, and, and that's really, I think, what financial institutes have to understand is your customers are saying, know me better, treat me like me. Don't just send me mass promotions. Don't just spam me with different offers. Make it relevant to me and I'll buy from you and I'll trust you and then I'll buy more products from you and then your MPS loyalty score will go up. Your cross promotions will go up. Your user engagement. Um, time spent on your device, the customer's time spent on your devices will increase. And, and really that's, that's the key thing. I think if we look at banking and, and financial services at the moment, you know, it's that they talk about the high cost of acquiring a new customer. Well, a lot of the fault should also be, and once you've got that customer, how do you treat them better? How do you treat them like an individual to keep them? Because if you do that successfully, and if you really build that connection, the, the, the lifetime value of that customer will just increase. And if the lifetime value of the customer increases, it means you can actually spend more to acquire new customers, brand new to your business. So it's, it's about utilizing the, the tools that are available uh, to be able to do that. So that, that's the three core products that we offer. Data aggregation to bring the banking data in, uh, data analysis to allow the customer and, and the bank to be able to analyze their results and then cash back really for that, in, that increase in the engagement and, and more personalized tailored offers. I think that, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, completely. I've made some notes to ask about your uh, applications. Um, actually, I've spoken in Moscow. We, we, we've had an interview with uh, your competitor uh, company. Uh, they called Pay Reverse. Pay Reverse, maybe you heard about them. Uh, they they do cash back as well as you, but I I don't understand. They they don't provide such uh, such a great amounts of return. Uh, how, how is that possible? How machine learning helps to you? In yeah, that? so so I think you, if I understand correctly, your question is how do we offer such high cash back? Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, very simply, is because it's 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 brand funded and not store funded. So if it's store funded, the, the store has to pay you 5%, no matter what you buy in their store. Okay, let's say it's just 5%. They can't offer you 50% because that just cuts their profit margin completely out. Whereas, and it means they have to run promotions to be able to fund that cash back offer. Whereas if it's brand funded, it means the brands, let's take Heineken beer for, as an example, if they do ca uh, cash back, which is brand funded, where they're funding it with us, they're only paying for customers who prove they buy their product. So um, it means they have no marketing cost where there is no return. They don't have to spend time and effort on marketing channels that don't work. They're paying for something that is purely dri driving them revenue, 100%. But in addition, the, the, the way in which that percentage can fluctuate between maybe 10% cash back to 50% cash back depends on the approach and how, much, how aggressive the brand wants to be. If, it, if you are a loyal customer buying Heineken every week, they may just say, okay, let's just keep offering 10%. We like, we like you, you like us, we're just gonna keep giving you 10% so that you don't go away. But they may turn around and say, okay, uh, we actually want to target people who buy our competitors' beer. So somebody is buying Budweiser, they're not buying Heineken, and we want them to buy Heineken. Let us target them within the, the, the mobile application, uh, the cashback facility that is within a bank's uh, uh, mobile application or web application. And we can target them because we know people, buy, because we have the transactional data, we know which people buy beer, we know how frequently, we know what beer they're buying, what quantity, what locations, etc. And so the brand can actually say, we want to try and steal some of that market share from Budweiser in this example. 
Therefore, if you are a Budweiser purchaser, we are going to give you an offer for Heineken uh, at 50%. So it means that they can actually, they're willing to pay more money to take that market share and they know they're taking it directly from that Budweiser or their direct competitor because that's who we're targeting. We, we are only targeting who they specify. So where we spoke before about cashback um, being targeted uh, to, to individuals and segments, you know, this is very, very precise marketing for them, which means there's no loss of uh, marketing expenditure. So that's why we can get that high level. I see. So you, you use machine learning for predict and for for uh under yeah yeah that's that's exactly it so so from the transaction and the item level data we start building up that picture and then as we start collecting more data we can build up that predictability so if for example we know that you buy dog food every three weeks pretty much over a whole year we can then send you a reminder that you need to buy dog food on your next shopping visit so that you don't forget but we could also then offer you from that brand of dog food that you normally buy, we could offer you an incentive to buy maybe some dog treats or some dog medicine or something else. Or we could offer a competing brand dog food at a much higher discount to try to get you to switch brand. So yeah, so the way that we're using that machine learning, that artificial intelligence is to try and plan the predictability of who's gonna buy what and what product we need to show to that customer. There's no point me showing you Heineken beer if you, if you don't drink. So everything that you'll see within the application is tailored to you as an individual. So your screen will be completely different to mine, different, completely different to your neighbors, and it'll be based upon what you buy, what shampoo you buy, what shower gel you buy, what toothpaste you purchase, what food you purchase, what beer you drink. It's, it's completely tailored to you as an individual because there's no, there's no good me showing you products you've never heard of or you never buy unless there's a reason that you buy them already. So switching out a brand can work very successfully for the brand and for the consumer if they're saving money. But there's no point me offering you beer, just uh, cash back on beer if you don't drink beer. So it's that it's, it's using machine learning and artificial intelligence to be, really be able to understand the user at a personal level uh, and make it relevant. And if you make it relevant, they will use your services much more, uh, which is increases engagement, increases loyalty, increases revenue over the long term. I see. And where do you collect the, the data, for example? Um, is it only from the open API of the banks or you have some other sources? Yeah, so it, it varies on the type of data that we get in. So of course, open API, uh, to, to bring in bank accounts, we, we can do that certainly. Um, things like loyalty programs, uh, we can work on via an API connection or, or, or just be able to uh, transfer that data across. Um, and then also the, there's ways in which we can get transactional data. So if we look at the cashback facility, um, how do we get that transactional data? So of course in Russia, um, you have that great, for us it's a great system where the tax authorities put, uh, keep a record of all transactions and then put a QR code on every receipt. So a scan of the QR code will give us the transactional items of, of what you've purchased, where, when, price, detail. Um, that, that for us is great because it's 100% accurate and we can see that information. Um, and so that's, that's great, we get a lot of data that way. But in addition to that, we can also uh, get customers to upload receipts and we use receipt recognition to understand everything from which store, which location, time, place, item level, uh, item size, price, discount offered, quantity, complete item uh, recognition so that we understand what you've purchased. Um, another way is by adding the loyalty programs. We can then uh, pull that transactional history directly from the from the loyalty cards as well. So, so there's really three or four ways in which we can get a lot of data uh, on the transactions uh, that, that customers are making. And of course, it's all consent based. So the customer has to say, yes, make these connections. We're not doing it uh, without the cus customer's consent or anything like that. This is a consent based approach to, to provide them a, a more tailored individual service. I see. And 
regarding your um, one application solution, let's call it like that. Uh, what do you think about uh, super apps trend coming from Asia, Asian markets? Do you think it's uh, it's a good way to to push people to use one 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 app ra rather instead of using some uh, di yeah. different? Um, I, I think it's, it's an individual choice and, and I think we will always see that and, and I think it will some of it might come, come down to demographics and culture and, and choice and so I think if we look at what's coming from the Asian markets they are they are very focused on one app make it much more efficient much more simple I don't have to think about it whereas if we come to different cultures people so let me talk about as a, as, as a British guy. And if I said to my mum, there's one app where you can do all of these things and it will have everything together. She'd be like, I don't want to do that. I want to have my banks here. I want to have my telecoms here. I want to. And so I think generationally, we might see some resistance to that. Uh, but also there is that personal choice about what you want to do. And I think it's, it's not too dissimilar to if we see things like the use of cash or instant or, or, or tap payments in different cultures in different countries. Some people will always choose to use cash, you know, either they don't trust the technology or it's how they prepare to use their money. Um, and I think you will notice from region to region, country to country, demographic to demographic, it's going to be different. So although I think some of that development is fantastic, uh, and you know we do a lot of that we, we allow our customers to bring a lot of that stuff together in, in one mobile application if they wish um, you're not going to please everybody it's not going to be suitable for everybody uh, and I think if you took a if you took a bank for example where where customers were had the option to do that you would find a whole range of, of people that would make different choices and so you would never get unless you force customers a hundred percent take up of, of a facility like that. So I think what we will see is, is a good option. It's another option. Um, consumers will dictate about how they want to use it. What do you think about the QR codes? Do you think they will replace normal cards, especially during these COVID days um, and, and further? Yeah, QR, I think, I think it's, you know, that, that technology has been around for a long time. The, the use seems to be increasing. Um, I think in Europe, definitely in the UK, I think we've been very slow to adapt to the ability of QR codes. Uh, I think we've seen uh, a lot of take up in other countries. Uh, but the UK, for some reason, and I don't know why, has been fairly slow around this technology and, and the, the opportunities behind it. It just hasn't really taken off here as a, as a function of, of, of usability. Uh, and I think the same is probably true across Europe. It is increasing year on year. So I think something like COVID may, may uh, improve those, those chances and, and we'll start to see um, uh, more benefits uh, as time goes on. Um, but it hasn't really reached the level, certainly not in the UK, that I think that many people were predict predicting maybe five years ago. Uh, but sometimes, you know, technology has to be around for a long time before the usability really starts to hit home. If we look at the, the contactless payment with a phone, you know, that technology has been around for 10 years. But it's only maybe in the last two years, three years in UK, uh, that it's starting to become much more common and that people are starting to do it. Um, and, and, you know, and I think sometimes it, it takes it's not going to be an instant overnight thing. You, you need to be able to see that slow development of time and, and the consumer needs to be able to see, well, what is the benefit of me to being able to use that or use it? And, and then that's when it slowly becomes adopted more over, over a period of time. Could you tell me about your shift to, about your journey to cash off? I mean, you, you, you haven't been in FinTech for all the, uh, for during all no, your life sure sure okay so let me tell you a little bit about me so um i studied uh, uh business and uh financial management uh from there i started off it in in marketing i decided that's really where i wanted to be and so i spent almost 20 years in in retail financial services so that's everything from uh independent investment advice 
uh, cryptocurrencies, uh, some, some banking, uh, some loyalty, but most of it really was around financial services and retail financial services. And then obviously more recently moving into fintech is, is there's been a whole new industry and, uh, and new opportunities, I think for people like me, to be able to utilize the skills that we may have built in more traditional forms, to then bring them to the fintech businesses to say, okay, right, this is how we want to think about it. This is how we can grow. And, and these are the benefits that we can start to showcase to, to potential clients. So I started off in very traditional independent investment advice, right through to cryptocurrencies, banking, now fintech. So yeah. So for the last 20 years, I've been doing that. Um, us as a company, um, Cash Off started in 2013 uh, from the Skolkova Innovation Center in Russia. And so we have an office in Moscow, and then we also have uh, uh, an office in Yaroslav. So we have maybe 50, 60 staff split between those two offices, uh, where we do a lot of our innovation and strategic planning, but then also our development as well. So we, as we develop new items, we scale our, scale our team up, or if we take on a new client, we scale our team up in that way. Um, we also have our, uh, our business development uh, office in, in Hong Kong. So we have an office in that region to really serve the Asian market. So we're looking at areas like the Philippines, Hong Kong, Thailand, uh, to, to give us, be able to, to you know, be able to work with banks and financial technology companies, sorry, financial institutions in that, in that region, a, a very localized hub. And then I work, uh, in the, the London business, um, really to service the European needs, but actually what we are finding that, of course, in Europe, we are governed by some of the services that we produce comes under open banking legislation, PSD2, uh, which was a European legislation from a couple of years ago that basically mandates banks have to open up their data to regulated third parties. And the reason for that is to provide a greater range of services, more competition, and to increase the technological advantages within banks. So to make really make the most of services that could be there for consumers. Um, but outside of London, I also take, I'm sorry, outside of Europe, I also take care of the rest of the world essentially. So whether that's Brazil or the Middle East or Africa, uh, and that's because there's starting to be demand from those countries saying, okay, we understand what's opening, happening with open and banking, we don't have our own regulation yet, so we're not, they're not too sure how quickly they can move to offer some of these benefits to their customers. Um, and so they're looking at what's happening within the European Union um, and saying, right, we know that something similar will happen uh, in our country. So if we take Turkey, for example, in Turkey, they just adopted the same regulation that we have within Europe, BS, PSD2. Um, but then if we look at a country like Azerbaijan, they're like, we would like to have that, that um, that same legislation so that we know what we can do and how we must operate, but it's not yet available from the regulator. So they're trying to, we, they're, in that instance, we have the banks pushing the regulator to say, come on, let's make a change, let's move forward. Um, but we're seeing those type of things happen in, in, in different locations. You know, Australia is developing their own versions, uh, Brazil has done their own. And so the world, there isn't really going to be an international standard, but there will be similarities between the regulation around open banking and, and those type of connections, I think internationally within the next two or three years. Do you think uh, basically in Russia, something similar, hap similar happening to Turkey and et cetera, because uh, in, in it's just test versions between different banks here and there, something happening, but um, what, why banks uh, are, could, could be interested in open API because sharing data with competitors with our with other fintech companies why should they do that it's maybe? a good question i think if you ask most of the ceos let's just say across europe of what they feel about open banking i think something like 70 or 80 percent of them will say it's going to be a good thing and the reason for that is because the more that you try to hide your data and you keep things just to yourself you're only working in that environment as big as you can keep that data together the minute that you open it up, it opens up new possibilities. So why work with a fintech company? Well, as if, like Cash Off, if we can access that data, we're probably going to be able to move much quicker to, to come up with a new idea, 
uh, test it and implement it than a bank would. The bank has everything else to deal with. You know, they have all of their legacy systems, they have their current projects uh, just to maintain. And so why wouldn't you open up your ideas to new people? It's basically saying to the fintechs and the wider industry, come and give me your best ideas and we will use them and we will pay for them, but it'd, it'd be cheaper to pay us to develop them and come up with them than it would be if they hired another thousand people and all just sat there and said, let's brainstorm about what we're going to do next. That's not typically how innovation works. The way to do it is say, who has a good idea and how do we partner with them to make sure that we can utilize it? Um, and so that the opening up of the data, I think is, is going to push banks out of their comfort zone. Uh, I think the banks that adapt and they move to that digital, to that digital zone will do very well. Those that embrace either their own internal teams or work with fintechs uh, will do very well because they will be innovative. They will find new services. And remember I said earlier on, the more features and services a bank has, the more the customer stays with them. So really the bank should be saying, what type of services do we want to deliver and how quickly can we deliver them? If we can't deliver them internally, then let's work externally. And that's, that re will really drive the innovation for them. It will give them more services that they can offer. It will keep their customers happier. Um, the banks that don't do that will slowly die. Uh, I have no doubt about that. It may, it may take 10 years or 15 years, but they will slowly die. And I think we've already seen how customers are willing to move very quickly now to banks that do what they want them to do. So if we look at Revolut or, or Monzo or any, any of those um, new banks, they've come along and said, okay, we, we, know, we know some of your pain points as a customer and we're going to solve them very, very quickly. We know you don't like paying uh, foreign exchange fees, for example, so we're going to remove them. You know, that's them thinking about what does the customer want? How do I talk to the customer personally and then deliver that service? Um, banks could have done that. Traditional banks could have done that for years, but they've chose not to. They've become very slow. They've become very internal. Um, and so there's, there's a lot of change, I think, going to be happening in banking. Some of those big banks might buy some of the other banks, I don't know, uh, just purely for the technology and, and the advancements they're going to bring. But I think what we've already seen is that, that fintechs offer a huge amount to banks. Um, it gives them more, more ideas. And so, yeah, they may have been a little bit um, concerned about opening up the data, but you've got to remember it's done in a regulated way, a controlled way, a consent-based way, um, and it, it's designed in a way to actually help the banks as well. It's for the customer, but it's also to help the banks move forward. And so I think overall, uh, most CEOs are very positive. All, most people that I speak to about open banking are very positive about it. Of course, there are, there's always challenges. So you've got sometimes cost, you've got to meet the regulatory obligations, then the legal obligations. Uh, and your systems need to be able to adapt. And I think that's one of the big sticking points for banks is that they have these old legacy systems that are not that adaptable. Well, if you don't adapt and change and upgrade or, or do something different, that, that legacy system is going to drag you down. Uh, and I think that's what's going to, to hold back some of that innovation for the banks, certainly. So, so there's, there's pros and there's cons there for for the banks, but it's great news for me and you as consumers because we should be getting better services that are relevant for us. Absolutely. Um, as what I see here in Russia, uh, in the past 10 years, uh, bank services improved dramatically. Just, uh, just amazing things happening because of the technology. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and the services that will come in the next one or two years, um, are not even thought about at the moment. That, that no, nobody has that idea about exactly what the services will be in two or three years time. We might have an, a, a very loose idea, but actually what will be developed in the coming two or three years doesn't even exist at the moment. And I think that's got to be really exciting for, for banks and consumers. So for the banks, they're going to find a new range of services that will make them money. 
And, and for banks at the moment, most of their traditional banking services that they provide, the margins and the profitability is getting squeezed year by year. So they're making less and less money, more competition, more efficiency, et cetera. Um, so I think for banks, they should be saying, what new services can we provide and how do we make more money from them? And normally more money will make, come from that personalization that we spoke about earlier. If you offer the right product to the right consumer at the right time, they're going to buy it. And so banks have to get much better at that. If we look at uh, some industries, they're really good at it. If you look at banking, they've been terrible at it. Their, their personalization on marketing and promotions has been, has been pretty slow to develop and adapt. Um, and that, unfortunately, that's the way of most very established markets. They can be very slow to adapt to technology. The same is true in construction. You might think construction, they build these wonderful buildings really quickly, uh, but quite often they have no digital version of that building. They've just built it and they've got some paper drawings that look lovely, but they don't have anything digitalized to say, when does something need to be replaced or expire? How efficient is it for energy? Those type of things. So the construction is going through a similar thing to banking, but in a slightly different way. And, but, but they're both huge industries that have been very, very slow to adapt. And I think the next five years will be um, a great time for those banks to really gear themselves up for the future. And, and those that do it well and quickly will prosper. Those that don't, it's probably goodbye. I see. But um, the question is, for example, if a cash off will provide services to every bank, what, where is the competition advantages there, there in, in that point, for example? That's, that's, a, great, that's a great question. Uh, if we worked with every bank in the world and offered just our services, that would be wonderful. But of course, where do those banks get those comp that, That's a great question. Um, I think as working with, our, with the banks, what we have learned, so we've worked with more than 50 banks internationally, and what we have seen is that um, every client is slightly different about what they want to offer. So we might offer a range of services and they say, we'll take that, 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 and that, that'll be slightly unique in some way. Um, another bank will do so something very similar, but they have their uniquenesses. But also banks are saying to us, okay, we like what you do. Could you change this just for us? And we're like, okay, we, we, could, we could do that for you. And, and I think what we'll start seeing is that the banks and the fintechs start speaking and working together to devise those new range of services that I've already spoken about, you know, that I, I mentioned earlier. Some things we don't even know exist yet will be coming via those collaborations and how things will change. So there will be, uh, there'll always be innovation and new developments that will supersede some of what we're doing today. And so it will always change. Um, we have competitors in the marketplace that do things differently to us. Um, so let's take our cashback, for example. We're probably, I think we're the only company that does brand funded cashback rather than store funded cashback. It's two huge differentiators. For some companies, they're going to say, yeah, we want brand funded. And they might have their particular reasons and goals why, and I would understand those. Other companies, let's say, okay, let's do cashback uh, brand funded, slightly different. And then there's variations that we can put on that. How can we use it differently? So a loan company could say, uh, our customer is paying back our loan every month. That's great. What if we allowed them to use our cashback to pay the, lo the loan quicker? One, co one company could do that. Another company, another bank could say, okay, all the cashback that a customer earns, we want to put into a child savings account or to a, a home savings account. Um, or into an investment fund or into a crypto investment fund. When you start looking at the type of services that we offer and, and actually how you can make them unique depending on the demographic and the profile of each bank's customer base, uh, you can turn one solution that we offer maybe into about 10 or 20 different versions of it that suit a particular niche market. So I think I that's, that's what we'll see is that we'll see the uh, the nicheness, the uniqueness of each each relationship between the bank and the fintech that would drive that innovation and the differences. Yeah, I've heard one uh, wor wor several words about it. It's like uh, competition on on a half tones. So uh, 
the banks they are different on some slightly different uh, they are not so different for the users but here and there some something different they they, they provide so okay uh, yeah i think if you look any, at the anyway, banks that are doing very yeah. well uh they they offer traditional banking services but they offer one or two things slightly different and that's what the customer buys into that's when they start believe that the bank is listening to them and providing the solution that they want that breeds huge customer loyalty uh, and that's what banks have to strive for yeah and i i see a very interesting uh, thing uh, for example in russia's beer bank they they provide they even provide a, a food delivery from the stores uh, i think banks they are realized that they are not very good actually for creating a value for their um, well for for the people who give money to them to to, to give rates back uh, because of the decrease in rates and so they're starting to realize that they should be as, as a startups they have an audience and they should monetize yeah them. yeah I, I think for sure banks are starting to look at it and say what else do we need to do you know that they've realized that that they've always known that keeping a customer is much easier than trying to find a new one so but now that the the challenger banks you know those new banks with the new innovation the new legislation for open banking in Europe and, and in wider markets is going to force banks to change. You know, if they do not change, they're going to get left behind. So they have to find the innovation. They have to find the partnerships. They have to be able to make the connections with the customer. They've got no uh, choice. Yeah. And regarding B2B, we always talk about B2C, but what about b2b for example our b2b system in 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 bank uh, in, in bank they just it's so obsolete and no one talk about business clients and do you think it will change somehow in in in, in the nearest future do, or... do, you, do you do you mean banking for for smes banking for businesses b2b yeah uh, yeah so, sme so banking... sme yeah, for SMEs. Okay, so so how does corporate banking or SME banking change? Yeah, it, it's changing a lot, um, and I think you're exactly right. Is um, there is a big market there, and 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 it's it is a good market, but banks haven't done anything different for 10, 20, 30 years in some instances. They've just been offering the same type of products to those uh, SMEs and saying these are the banking services. There you go. Whereas the same the same um, uh, the same changes that we've seen in retail or, or, or uh, personal uh, accounts, individual accounts, we've seen the same type of changes in, in, in um, business account, SME accounts, in that things like data analytics that I spoke about earlier on, the, the personal financial management reporting, businesses need to do that as well. They need to be able to have all of their data in one place because quite often they will have different accounts for different purposes. Uh, and they also need to analyze their income and expenditures in, in, in more detail. Rather than doing it via an Excel spreadsheet, you should be able to do that within your banking app. And so that's where we're starting to see those changes uh, and that connectivity, but also is the connectivity with other sources. So, you know, I spoke earlier on about individuals connecting other bank accounts and loyalty programs, et cetera. Um, SMEs need to do the same. They need to connect with their, um, payment services accounts, maybe their, their taxes account, uh, you know, their, their stationary orders, uh, regular suppliers. So it's, it's that data aggregation of different types of data that suit the, can suit the business need. And, you know, if, if we look at services like uh, accounting software like Xero have had a lot of success uh, because they've challenged the, 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 the current existing accounting softwares but now they're at a stage where we're saying okay how do they, how do they develop and, and move further it is going to be by that that open banking approach that that data connectivity approach for businesses to make it easier for them if you bring everything together if you have more of your data sources in one place you can make better decisions and so retail individual customers banking business sme company customers are on the same path that the products are slightly different but they're on the same path of change, new innovation. The banks that get it right will do very well. I see. Um, 
could you uh, I mean have you heard about some interesting startups in that field uh, for SMEs off the top of my head no um, I, I see we, we work with um, so we, we work on business banking as well so the same type of services that we're providing for, for banks for their individual clients, we're providing the same type of services on the corporate side. And I think, <coughs> excuse me, some of the services are going to be the same, like the type of data, the connection that, that, cust that banks want to bring together. Uh, but some of them are going to be unique to different countries. So if we take um, Russia, for example, you have to prove that you're paying your taxes, uh, so you need to be able to connect your bank account so that you've proved that you've paid your taxes from one of the accounts. Uh, in Azerbaijan, if you want, to, if you're a business and you want to open a bank account, you have to prove that you're paying your tax to the to the tax authorities. Therefore, you can make a connection that links the banks with the tax authorities and the customer, make that customer journey much easier. And I think the SMEs. Uh, business is, is going to be unique from country to country. What are the tax rules? What are the banking rules? What are the challenges that are there in each of those regions? And I think it will probably be solved on a, a country by country basis. I guess this is, these were all the questions that I have at the moment. Uh, I am always, I always ask in the end of the conversation about some mistake that uh, you probably may have done in your past just to share to that we can learn from yeah so a mistake that I in a previous role I made is that we were very reliant on one marketing channel uh, so we, we were working in, in, in financial services and and something like 90% of our new business came via this one marketing channel and we then had a problem with that marketing channel. So overnight, we lost 90% of our new leads into our business because we didn't have that diversification. The reason we didn't have that diversification is because the channel that we were using was much cheaper than any others and much more efficient and much more successful. But what it shows is that if you don't have that diversification, um, even if it costs you more money sometimes, you don't know when you're going to need it. So, so the one lesson I learned maybe 15, 20 years ago uh, was you better have more, better have more routes to get new customers, because if you don't, you don't know when something's going to happen uh, that you're going to need it. So, and, and, and a really good example of right now with COVID, I know a lot of companies were reliant on exhibitions to get new customers. Uh, well, no exhibitions have happened for the last three months and no more will probably be happening for another two or three months. That's six months without any new leads into their business. Um, that's a very difficult position to be in. So my advice that I learned very early, I think has enabled us to be able to move uh, and been okay. Um, but so my, my advice would be is try to think about how many, as, as a marketer from training, how many marketing channels do you have that are bringing you customers? and try and get one or two more or just try and have some backups in place from my from my side it's just only one add-on that's uh you need to build i guess th these days uh, the community of or your, your own community where well with you who you can speak about professional uh topics and uh, they should know you well and etc this 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 is great differenti dif differentiation from the competitors just what i see <laughs> uh well darren it it was very interesting um, interview from my point of view uh you have shared your great experience i i, I believe it would be helpful for our viewers and in future for listeners because we are going to make a podcast from from such videos so thanks again for joining no us today thank you very much for inviting me uh, and good luck for the future yeah thanks thank you